Hi there, my name is Jeremy Snell. Welcome back to my Chain of Sprockets tutorial. Um, this is part two, which is called Creating the Chain Path and Clone Distance Guide. So, as you'll see on the screen, this is where we left off with part one with our three layers of master pitch, point 0.36 and point 0.15. And uh, we're working in the back view here, so I'll just maximize that and zoom in. Okay, firstly I'm going to start with a spline demonstration, which will help you understand the method in my madness. So, I'm going to exaggerate the example, of course, and uh, that should help illustrate the point I want to stress. So, pick a blank layer, layer 5, my favourite blank layer, and I'm going to create a disk, and the method for which we've been over. So, I'm going to create a four-sided disk, again, lower number of points will emphasise this, created around the origin, 0, 0, 0, doesn't matter on the size, as it's just a demo. Okay, here we go. Now, this is a spline demonstration, and if you imagine that these points on the disk represent, for example, a four-sided sprocket, and this will be the front sprocket. Uh, the rear sprocket will be, for example, if I zoom out far enough, if the rear sprocket is over here, where I'm circling the mouse now, the chain path will wrap around the right half section of the rear sprocket, come along, run along the top here, run around the top, of our front sprocket and wrap around the front half of it and then return back at a great distance down and around the rear sprocket again. So, in order to have uh, the chain path coming in, I need two extra points to represent the path coming in and the outgoing trajectory of the spline. So, I'm going to use the plus tool to create points. It's under here, create points plus. I'm going to place one point here roughly vertically aligned to the top of the sprocket, somewhere over here, and I'm going to right click to create another point, I can just drag that anywhere, and I'm going to place it just a bit lower, just a, as a, an, uh, an excellent example. Now, the way splines work is they have a start point and an end point, so if I chose, this is my start point, um, the path of the spline will follow the order in which I select my points. So, before I can do this, I need to get rid of this polygon. Now, I can't use delete, as it will delete all of the points as well, like that. So, let's undo that. I need to use the kill command, which lives somewhere. It's actually remove polygon. Um, let's see where we find it. I'll probably come back to this later. Ah, here we go. Reduce, remove, and it's called remove polygon. And the shortcut, if I don't highlight it, you'll see. Underneath the mouse now, it says K, lowercase K. So, I remember it as K for kill. So, if I press it now, K, it's removed the polygon, but left the points remaining. So, this is an example of point selection order. So, if I start here, point 1, I'll go to point 2, then I can go over here, point 3, point 4, point 5, point 6. And when I create my spline, which is basically a curve, so if you look under Create tab, under Curves, and down here we have Make Curve, and there are two types of curve you can create. You can make an open curve or a closed curve. Now, for this example, we'll be using an open curve, using Control p is the shortcut. Um, closed curve is later on because our entire chain is a closed loop. So, Control p or open curve here. As you can see, it has now created a curve following the exact order I selected my points in. So, obviously this is complete nonsense and nothing to do with <laughs> what I need to show you. So, I can just undo this creation. Now, start points here. The chain will run in along here, hit the top point on the sprocket. It will now wrap itself around to the next point on the sprocket. Exiting the bottom of the sprocket, it will leave that and it will follow off down to the next point towards the rear sprocket. I'm now going to create the spline out of these points in this order, and this is the result here. Now you can see the emphasis is on this front section here. It's rather pointed. Now this should represent a perfect circle or a semicircle for this part here, as this is the path the chain should take around the sprocket. Okay, now on the next available layer, layer 6, I'm going to put uh, layer 5 in the background, and I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to create a disk, I'm going to press N for numeric because it will remember all of the previous settings we have here. 
Um, under four sides, I'm going to show you that using a multiple of the original number of teeth we have, or rather points representing our sprockets, you can get a much more accurate curve. So I'll use four and a multiple, I'll multiply by ten, just to give us a lot of points. This will give us 40 points. And this has now created a circle, or rather a disk of 40 points, in the same location and size as our original 4.1. Okay, using the same demonstration, I'm going to swap layers using the apostrophe key, and I'm going to loop select these two points here, copy them, swap the layers again, and control V, paste them back in here, and just zoom in slightly. Now, same thing again, point order, select the start point, we're going to enter the sprocket at the top point only, we're not going to be concerned with this semicircle points over here. So. Hold down shift if you've let go to add to the selection and select in order around. It doesn't matter if you get them in the wrong order, if I've missed a few, whoops, I can just deselect those and reselect and it'll remember the original count of the point order. As you go along it'll name them. We'll finish on the bottom centre point and we'll fly off out to the final point and control P to create our spline. Here we go. Now if I zoom in just the front portion, you can see that this has described a much more accurate curve or circle and the, you can see that the black line in the background represented our four points. So, the final way to emphasize this point is if it's not enough, I will highlight these four points, I'll copy them to layer 7 and paste them in there, and I will put our original spline in the background. Just highlighted the points on the top layer. I'm going to use the um, rotation tool again as my demonstration. Now, under rotation modes, this was created around the origin, so we could use either origin or mouse center action uh, selection here. I'm just using selection. Um, it's, it's not a problem which. Okay. Uh, because it's a four-sided, an even number of sided disk or number of points we've created, it'll therefore accurately rotate either method we use. So, why to rotate? What we're looking for is for these points to follow the path, and as I slowly rotate this around, you can clearly see that they don't. And this will show up as the chain, if we use this as our cloning path, the chain would then wrap itself within the sprocket's um, outermost extremes of the circle, if you like. So that's no good to us. Um, let me undo the rotation. And if I now put the opposite layer in the background, where we use more points to describe the same circle, and I do the same method of rotation, you'll see that it accurately follows a nice path. So, the old question is, how many points do I need to use in Lightwave to create the illusion of a circle? Lightwave doesn't actually know what a circle is. It doesn't deal with true circles. A true circle has an infinite number of points around it. Lightwave requires a finite number of points. So. The more points, the more accurate your circle will be. It's the same with subdivision and anything else. It's not just for this blind purpose. Okay, that's that demonstration done. I'm going to delete all of these. Uh, we no longer need them. I've got quite a few notes on my other monitor here, which I'm referring to, so if I'm pausing at all or seem hesitant, it's probably because I'm looking at these notes. Alternatively, it's because I'm not happy with the MP3 track I'm running at the moment, and I'm looking for a better one to play. Going to point underscore 36, and zooming into fit all, I'm going to copy the top two points, and control C, copy them to RAM. I'm going to go onto layer 4, and paste them into here, and we're going to be using a radial array again. That's control Y as a shortcut. And make sure you select radial, it's about the origin, which is where we originally created. We need the Z axis, as it's coming in and out of the screen, and X and Y are on the screen, so we wish to rotate around it do not have merge points on again, as we will be using the accuracy checking method of merging later. Now the number of clones, now the layer we've copied from is point 36, so we'll start with 36 as a number, now there's no point using that number because we'll end up with exactly the same array as this. So what I'm going to do is 36 put on multiplied by 2 and tab, and it's going to give us two lots of 36, which is 72 because the more points we use, the more accurate the curve will be to describe. And always use a multiple of the original number of points, so that we can use the points that are now cloned as our guide for the pitch. So, OK to that. 
point statistic shows that we have 144 points. Again, every time I select one point, it's actually two sitting on top of each other. Two, four, six, eight, ten, etc. So, M to merge. Don't need to worry about keeping one point polygons as they're not connected to any polygons. And automatic. So, okay, we're looking for 72 to be eliminated, 72 to remain. So, down here, 72 eliminated, 72 remain. Let me go back to point 36, and I'm going to copy this center point for rotation. The reason for which I explained in the previous part. Okay, I'm going to name this layer point underscore 36, as the previous layer was, underscore. Now I'm going to put 2 in the end because we multiplied 36 by 2. I could put point underscore 72, but this will give us an immediate visual reference that it is linked to the 36-sided teeth. So, okay to that. Now we need to do the exact same thing with our point 15. So, select the top two points, copy them to RAM, go to layer 5, the next blank one, press Ctrl V to paste them in. Control y to activate the radial array. Now, again, everything's around the origin. It's z-axis and do not have merge. So, 15 points for our initial. And remembering we need a multiple of 15 in order to keep uh, the pitch points in the right location. Uh, this time I'm going to multiply them by 4, up the number. Um, this gives us 60 points. You could multiply it by whatever number you, whatever number you wanted. Um, 60 is enough. It's a slightly smaller sprocket. So, uh, 60 is going to be adequate. So, OK to that. And zooming in. We have 120 total points, so M to merge, as there will be two sitting on top of each other. OK to that. 60 points eliminated, 60 points remaining. Again, pick any one of these layers, copy the center point, paste it into this one here. So, if I zoom out somewhat here, you'll see that we have our point 36 layer and the multiple of that which I'll put into the background corresponding to this so what we have is twice the number of points so they all actually fit the same location and this is likewise the same with point 15 and the next new layer which I haven't yet named so there will be three points not related to it then it's one point three points not three one etc all the way around so I'm going to name this layer to point underscore 15 underscore 4 because that's what we multiplied it by. Okay. Four. Okay, we're just going to save the file here, so S on the keyboard. Let's save this. Okay, time to go on to layer 6. I'm going to rename this to master underscore spline. Now, the next part is to copy. We'll start with the 15 point underscore 4 layer. And um, this will represent our front sprocket. So I'm going to copy this whole layer, all the points here, paste them into the master spline layer here, control V. I'm going to put point underscore 36 underscore 2 in the background, just as a visual marker. Now, the rear sprocket we will keep around the origin so we won't ever move this from that location. The front sprocket we will move away from the origin and our chain will then wrap around the two sprockets. Obviously they can't sit on top of each other because there will be a conflict in which the chain. So, T to move, just move it roughly away and that's fine, drop the tool. You can swap the layers or go to point 36 underscore 2, copy the contents of this layer, go to our master spline layer, paste it into this layer. I'm just going to press A to zoom to fit that. Now, um, for this chain of sprockets tutorial, I'm going to align vertically the tops of these two sprockets. So that's the center point here. As you can see here is the highest point on this, on this arc. And likewise, this point here is. So I'm going to align the top two points of these together. So in order to do that, I need to loop select all of the points correlating to the front sprocket and I'm going to use the snap tool which is under modify translate there's a more tab click on that and it's called snap drag tool the shortcut for which is capital G which is shift G on the keyboard so we'll click that it's very important to look in the numeric panel on this tool 
and we're looking drag set. Now, if it's on one point, that means when you pick any one of these points and click and hold and drag, it'll move just that point and it'll snap it to whichever point you select to. Obviously that's no good to us, so I'll undo that. If you use connected points, that means it'll select the point you have clicked your mouse on to move, plus any other points that are physically connected by polygon lines to that. Now there aren't any polygons actually present, we're just using points here, so this is an irrelevant choice. So all points is what we're looking for. That means all points in your selection, not all points on the screen. If you have nothing selected, then it means everything is selected. That's the way Lightwave works. So if I clicked any one of these points, it would drag the whole selection set. It doesn't matter which point I select. So the important one we're looking at, just going to zoom in so that we can see the top two points. If I click and holding down control to constrain the movement to the y-axis only, we're only looking for vertical alignment here. So clicking down the mouse, holding down control now, you have to hold down control, oh, I've undone that. You have to control, hold down control first, and then click the mouse and drag. So I can move the mouse left and right, it won't move the selection any other way other than vertically. Now I can pick any one of these points to snap and align the point I originally selected, the top middle one too. Now you'll see if I move the mouse very finely, slowly, even at the frame rate I've captured this at, you should see that over here the mouse is moving up and down very slightly and the whole selection is moving up and down. As I get approach and point there will be a dead zone of a fraction of, you know, perhaps two or three points widths worth where I'm moving the mouse but the selection isn't moving. That means it's snapped to that point. So bearing that in mind I'm going to then snap it to the top point of the centre of the sprocket on the right and let go of all the buttons. This now has aligned these two. In order to check that, you can select the top middle button here, the uh, point here, and the top of the front and rear sprockets. Bring up Y for information, and look at the Y values. Again, if it doesn't say mixed, it means they share the same values, which they do, so cancel that out. These are now correctly vertically aligned. Okay, quick reference to the notes. Scrolling down them. OK, we've done the information point. Right. OK, time to zoom out. If you have a guide, a background guide, for example, if you have a blueprints for a motorcycle uh, showing the location of the front and rear sprockets of your chain and the path of your chain, or if you have a relevant model that you've already created with, say, fixed locations for sprockets to be in, then this is where you would, in your project, move your spr front sprocket to the location of your model's front sprocket and vice versa for the rear. Um, as this is a demonstration, I'm going to just guess a distance as I don't have any reference. Now the thing to note is that the actual final distance will be adjusted slightly and this may involve you having to adjust your model. So bear that in mind. Press T to move. As we have aligned these vertically, I only want to move along the x-axis. So I'm going to hold down control first and then click, as I've just learned. <laughs> so, drag to a distance that I think is approximately a good a good distance for creating a chain sprocket system. So, we'll say there just happens to be negative 350 millimeters, but it could be any distance at all. It's, it, it's not an issue. So, I'm going to deselect that and press A to zoom in. Okay, I just want to show you quickly about the uh, splines have a starting point and how I have my user interface set up to show that it's going to be quite difficult for you to see them. If I just selected around here, just these points, to create a demonstration spline, I've selected them from here as my starting point, around to here as my finishing point. Control P to create an open curve or spline. Press spacebar to highlight. Now this will only be present when you have the spline highlighted, that it shows the start point. Now, this point here we know is the start point, and it's actually represented by a slightly different point style. It's actually a diamond shape. Now, I don't think, it won't matter how far in I zoom, it won't actually make that any larger or more visible for you to see, because it scales it. Now, the reason it looks quite undistinguishable from any other points is because of my user setup. If I press D on my keyboard to show you my display options, under Interface, 
At the bottom here I've deliberately selected to choose simple wireframe points on and they have a fixed points pixel size of four points. If I untick this, you'll see that all of these points get smaller except this point here at the front. So I'll untick that. All of these points have now become smaller points. And this one here is actually more emphasized. You can see the diamond shape. So if your setup is different to mine, this is why. I use simple wireframe points because it, I find it's easier to actually find, to visually see the location of the points for moving them about. It's just a nicer way, especially if you have um, perhaps a backdrop image or a reference image with a lot of noise in it. Then this helps clear that up and differentiate the points from noise. So I'm going to cancel that, keep my settings the same. So I'm going to undo the spline creation because that was just a demonstration and zoom to fit all again. Okay, so starting with the top point on the right set of points, top center of the right sprocket if you like, this will be our start point. This will always now from now on be our start point for our clone section and our spline creation. So starting here I'm going to loop select in point order a spline around here. So top center point, the chain will span from here to the top center point of the front sprocket. While it may physically touch any of these points here, I'm not going to actually deal with this, I'm not going to be concerned with these points here, because these are enough to describe the curve. And technically these would be the only ones actually in contact with any force on the rollers of the point teeth. So top center rear sprocket, top center front sprocket, and then we'll select round in order. Again if you miss any, deselect and then reselect them back in the correct order. Just have to move your mouse. You may need to clean your mouse to get a smoother feel. This one could do with some cleaning. Okay, I'm going to now go down to select the vertical center so we have half the front sprocket selected. Okay, zoom out. That's the front sprocket dealt with. I'm going to zoom into the rear sprocket slightly now. I don't know the actual angle this should come in at, so I don't know which of these points it will actually hit. It won't necessarily hit the bottom centre as they are not um, vertically aligned at the base of the sprocket, so only the top is vertically aligned. So, because I don't know where it comes in here, I'm going to emphasise so that I make sure I definitely include the points for the line, and because it's going to be easier to deselect or remove points from a spline than it is to add them at the midpoint of a selection without having to reselect all of the points we've just done. So it's definitely going to hit in here. So I'll really emphasize it and put it right up there. It probably, I have to guess, will come in down here, one of these two or three points here. So again, continue the loop selection. I've missed a point there by mistake, so deselect that, hold down shift and continue to select. Okay, now we've come to the start point again, which is now the start and end point. So, create curves, make curve. This time they have to make a closed curve. There is no shortcut for this, so you have to come here. Right, spacebar to highlight. You can now see our spline is wrapping around from the top sprocket all the way around. It's not particularly smooth, but this was deliberately intentional so that we could remove any points from the spline at a later point. Okay, quick reference to the notes. Okay, now ensure that the last thing you did was create this spline because we're going to use the undo feature quite a bit here. I will start with the front sprocket and zoom right in until you can see the curve quite clearly and where it exits the sprocket. Now you should be able to see here that at this section here it has a kink it, or rather it's not exactly smooth. It should travel around in a loop arc and the exit trajectory should be a smooth line straight off to the rear sprocket. So this point here is in fact messing up our trajectory. So I'm going to press the undo. This will now undo the creation of the spline but it will retain the points that are selected and also the point selection order. So for example if this is point 18 that you selected it'll remember that this is point 18, 19, 20, 21 and way off at the front sprocket 22. 
If I deselect these, it'll still remember the point over 18, 19, 20, while point 21 will have disappeared from the selection. It'll then rename the next in sequence to 21, 22, 23, etc. So, deselect this point, then we need to go back and recreate our curve. Recreate make closed curve. And then you have to just eyeball to check to see how smooth it is. Now, this one's so close that we don't know if it actually does positively or negatively affect our curve. The way to test to see if you're not sure of a point is to select that point while it's still part of the curve and to cut that point and paste it back in. And if the point remains on the outside of the actual curve, then that means that it's actually needed because this chain path will now go within the sprocket slider. If it was on the opposite way round, then it wouldn't be needed. So I'm going to undo, undo again to put the point back onto the point. No, rather, <laughs> I'm not starting that pointing again. Okay, zoom in, zoom out. Okay, now we're going to deal with this portion of the rear sprocket, exactly the same as before. You can see that this is a, a large what's the word, deviation from the path, from a smooth straight path that we need from the rear sprocket to the front sprocket. So many of these points aren't needed. So I'm going to undo the creation of this. I'm going to deselect several points that I know will definitely not be part of this. And I'm going to recreate the curve. Okay, zoom in here so you can see a finer adjustment. Now, it's still kinking in the wrong direction here. So I'm going to undo the creation of that, deselect an extra point, recreate the curve. It's still kinking here. So undo, deselect and recreate, still a kink undo, deselect recreate it looks like there's still a kink here very slight, so undo, deselect recreate again now we're getting to the point where I'm not entirely sure whether this is part of the curve whether it's kinking or not so, we can just cut that point paste it back in actually undo that because I hit the wrong key. Cut that point, paste it back in. You might need to zoom right in here. Now, this point lies on the inside of the curve, whereas previously it was on the outside. Therefore, if you attached this curve to this point, it would pull the chain in away from the actual smooth path. So it is not needed and not part of the actual link. So we'll leave that disconnected. Right, now, the next part to do is to clean the number of points out that we don't need that aren't actually part of this spline. So, using polygon selection, I'm going to select the spline, it's under curves here, and I'm going to press the minus key to hide this. Um, it's under the view tab. We have views here, you have hide selected, which is minus, hide unselected, which is equals, hide inverted, which is the which is a good question. I think it's a pipe key. It's a vertical line anyway. And we have unhide, which is uh, the backslash key. So I'm going to hide this selected. Click that. Flip to point selection. Or press spacebar to toggle to it. I want the center point still remaining. So I'm going to hide those as well. Finally, I'm going to toggle the hiding selection from. So I'm going to invert. What you can see now will be hidden. What you can't see is going to come back into view. So hide invert. So now all the points remaining with the exception of the two centre points are part of the actual spline in the correct place. Having said that, this one looks out of place. So cut it, paste it, we can see it clearly wasn't part of the spline as it's now inside. So select that one and hide it. Okay, this is now smooth. Okay, now, because of the way we have our chain uh, laid out, as it's running horizontally, uh, we now have to account for gravity. Now, if your sprockets were vertical, vertically aligned, one on top of the other, then down the sides where they weren't stretched around an actual sprocket, you wouldn't need to account for gravity so much, depending on the distance apart. So, as chain has significant weight to it, 
over a distance it will bow down and sag regardless of the amount of tension that is under well to a point and the top part as it runs counterclockwise around the system in this case the front sprocket will drive forwards in order to drive the rear sprocket which drives the rear wheel and the bike would move from right to left across the screen in this case so there would actually be more slack in the bottom portion of the chain than there would in the top so in order to account for this we need to add two extra points to our spline so highlight your spline we're going to be looking under multiply subdivide and its add points I have assigned a key which is the lowercase x to it uh, which I found quite helpful from my previous spline tutorial I went through um, if you wish to add it, your own shortcut to it you need to go to your edit panel and edit menu layout actually that's wrong you would need to go to edit <laughs> edit keyboard shortcuts uh, you can do a search for add points especially if you spell it correctly add points ok and then you can click find and it will find the actual command you'll see here there's a key associated with it on the left and you can assign or unassign that shortcut key to that command so back to where we were doing add point now the emphasized part of the chain that would be most susceptible to gravity will be the center point from where it is spanned so that would be here where my mouse is now and also at the bottom central from the rear sprocket and front sprocket here so I'm going to place a point here so click once and once only as each time you click it will create a point one there and one vertically down from it it doesn't have to be exact but if you're keeping it centered keep it as close as you can and one down there ok spacebar to drop the tool spacebar again to get into point selection mode I'm going to loop select check that I've only created two points which I have and deselect so I mean the importance of this with motorbikes is that motorbikes themselves have built in adjusters that allow the rear wheel to move forwards or backwards along the swing arm in order to alter the tension of the chain I mean if it's too tight the chain will generate excess friction and uh, heat up and this will result in a loss of horsepower which will be delivered to the rear wheel and also drastically reduce, uh, <laughs> drastically reduce the life of the chain and the transmission through wear uh, if the chain however is on the other hand too loose you then you run the risk of the chain coming off the sprockets and either it could end up trying to fold the bike in half or it could remove your left leg if you're unlucky unless that bit of plastic called the chain guard can stop it so the recommendation for when you're actually tensioning your chain on your motorbike the recommendation is to have at the base portion here um, 20 to 25 millimeters of play so that would be vertically and uh, well, it'll be vertical positive and vertical negative of the central point where these lines will cross. So, selecting this point in the centre, bearing that in mind, we're going to press T to move, N for numeric, and starting with 000, zero, zero we're only interested in the Y value here, so start with negative as we wish to move it downwards. Um, start with 25 millimetres, and then divide that by 2 because it would also move this distance half 25 millimeters up, half 25 millimeters down so hit tab it's calculated at negative 12.5 millimeters so click apply only once and this has now moved that point downwards which has now affected our curve so drop the tool now the next thing to do is to vertically align this top point here with the top points of the sprockets so that it is in fact a straight line. Now you may think this is actually already in a straight line but the way splines work in smoothing out a curve they don't go from point directly to point directly to point like dot to dot they actually interpolate a smoothest point curve around it and as we've added this point to there to emphasize the path this would have actually bowed upwards slightly. Um, to prove this in case you don't believe me I will select the top point of both sprockets and the centre point here. So you can see down the selection of three points, I zoomed in to show you that I have in fact selected the top points of both sprockets. If I bring up I for information, you should see that the Y value should be the same. And as it says mixed here, then it means that one of them is clearly one, at least one of them is clearly not showing the same value. Now, 
as I click these points, the actual point itself will be highlighted with a number. Um, if I get two points on the screen, then you can just see that. So it's 116 here, point number, 1135. So Y values here is 91.07, 91.07 on the Y value, and here is 91.14, so this is slightly higher. We'll click cancel here. So what we need to do is to highlight this point here in the center, press shift G to use the snap tool again. We can keep it on all points because it's all points of our selected selection, which in this case consists of one point. Holding down control to constrain the portion vertically only, move the mouse up and down can see what this is doing. And now I'm going to snap it to this point here. And when you're happy that it's snapped, let go and deselect. Now, I'm going to select these same three points again, press I for information, and confirm that it is in fact moved them all to the same Y value, which they have now. It doesn't say mixed. So, cancel that. Okay, now that we've aligned this, we need to now account for some gravity and sag in here. While it will be less emphasized, because this is under greater tension, there will still be a slight amount of sag. If you don't feel it's necessary for a project, please don't include it. The reason I've put it in this tutorial is for a little bit of realism, and it's a bit more fun, perhaps. It's just something to be aware of when creating these things. So, T to move, N for numeric. I have absolutely no idea what the true value may be, so I'm only going to move it a fraction down. I'm going to move it negative 2 millimeters, and hit tab. And then I'm going to click apply once. Each time you click this apply, it will add it to the distance set in here. So if I clicked apply once, it would move it negative two. If I clicked it three times, it would be moved six millimeters down. So click it only once. And you may have seen that move down once. Okay. So our chain path now here has a nice tiny amount of bowing in the top and a great amount of bow and sag in the bottom. Now, adding this sag in the base portion may have actually interfered with our smoothness of our chain on both the bottom sections of these sprockets here. So, again, it's back to this section of zooming in, seeing if it's smooth or not. You may not be able to visibly tell, so the way to do it is to highlight a point, cut it out, and paste it back in. If the point lies on the inside of the chain path, then it is not needed. And in this case, this one does lie on the inside. You may need to zoom in considerably to see that or not. So, therefore, it is not needed to describe a smooth path. So, I'm going to hide it. Done. If I'm not sure about the next point, you can just do exactly the same thing. Cut. Paste. It's clearly lying on the outside, more so than the previous point was on the inside. Therefore, it is needed in order to prevent the chain from going on the inside of the sprocket. So I'll undo that and undo again. So this is point is now part of the spline again. So we've now smoothed the front sprocket. Zoom in into the rear sprocket. Exactly the same method again, same process. Unsure on this point. Cut it. Paste it back in. Zoom right in in this case. I have to really zoom in. It lies on the inside of the chain path. Therefore it is not needed. Loop select it. Hide it. As that was such a small amount, I have no doubt that this is a required point. So, finally now we have our smooth chain path under our master spline. Okay, just going to save the file at this point. So that's saved now, S for save. Okay, <laughs> yes. Now, this section, part two, is actually the most difficult part of all of them in the sense that we have to do some a lot of fiddly work um, there will be some more fiddly work later, but it's not exactly difficult. It's just tedious and time-consuming. <laughs> Whereas this is tedious, time-consuming, and slightly difficult to work out. So, tricky part, we need to create enough links to wrap around the two sprockets following the path we have created so that the final link connects to the first link, bearing in mind we have a fixed link length. Now, Lightweb doesn't offer a tool currently to measure the length of a curve, so we can't actually use that to our advantage. So the closest tool available is called the Rail Clone Tool. Now this tool will use a background layer that has a curve or a spline on it as its rail or guide for cloning and aligning the objects in the foreground layer too. 
Now, unfortunately, this tool does not allow us to fix the distance between clones like the actual clone tool does. Instead, it evenly distributes the spacing of the clones along the full length of the rail or spline guide. Now, I want to stress the point that the results will not be 100% accurate and should be used purely as a guide, hence guide. Cannot stress that enough. We will later improve the accuracy at the end of the cloning process, though. Um, that's where more tedious work comes in, as I mentioned earlier. Hey, hey, more fun, hey? So, while working out the sprocket spacing, and therefore the overall chain length, we'll be using points to represent the centre location of each roller. So, bear that in mind as we go along. Okay, next one is to rename layer 7, as this will be the next layer we'll be using. As I said, I'll be saving this non-incrementally, just overwriting the same file, but the history of our tutorial will be kept and tracked in these layers. So, rename layer 7. I'm going to call this clone underscore distribution. Uh, check that I've spelt it right. We will be slightly modifying the name of this layer later. With clone distribution in the foreground and master spline in the background, or rather the other way around, so I'm going to use the apostrophe key to invert or swap my layers. Um, for this purpose, at this point, I will ask you to unhide all of the points we've hidden on this layer. So, that's under view, view, that's twice, unhide or the backslash key, so click that. It's brought all of our points into view, as we will no longer be modifying the number of the points attached to the spline. We don't need to lose the clutter as such. So, it is no longer an issue. But it will benefit us to keep them in view. So, now, we need to copy the start point. Remember, we started the spline with this point, and we copied, counted all the way around, select them in order. It's very important to remember this point here. Again, I've shown you through the user interface how to work out where your spline point is, represented by the diamond. So, highlight the top center start point, copy that, swap your layers, and paste it in there. So now this shares the exact same location as our start point because, frankly, it's a copy of it. Okay, this is where the multiply, duplicate, and under more we have rail clone as an option. So make sure it's rail clone and no other one, as only rail clone will do as far as I'm aware. So click that, this brings up our options. Now this is where a bit of guesswork comes in, however there are two things to note first. Make sure that uniform lengths is selected. Uniform lengths will be the evenly distribute points along our spline. Uh, command. Now, orientated isn't necessarily relevant for this part, but keep it ticked as we will be using it later. Orientation will means it will rotate whatever object you are cloning around to be sitting parallel or whatever the original starting rotation that you have selected around. And as we have a point, it has no three dimensions or two dimensions. It's simply a one-dimensional object. There's no need for orientation. But we'll keep it in for the time being. Now, your start point will basically be a pure guess. Now, having done this a few times, I find that somewhere between 70 and 120 is the value, depending on the distance between. Now, this value here represents the number, in this case, not of links, but of rollers. As I said, two rollers, or link rollers, create one link length, because the center points of them are the pitch. So, I'm going to start with a value of 70, just pluck that out of the air, and then I'm going to click OK. And what you'll see is that it has followed the path in the background, and it has cloned points at an even spacing apart, all the way around until back to the center, or back to the start point. Now, how do we know if we've got the right number of points or not? Well. We have 36 teeth sprocket in the background, which we used as our starting point. Now, half of 36 is 18, and therefore we need 18 points to have been cloned on one half. And as we, this is the only, the right half of the semicircle is the only part that the chain actually physically stays in contact with. This is where we use our counting. So, loop select around. And see how many points. Now it says there are in my selection set there are 15 points. 
and we need 18, so there are too few, therefore 70 clones was not enough. So, I'm going to undo this whole cloning process. We'll be doing this so many times you wouldn't believe it. Okay. Back. Duplicate rail clone. This time I'm going to up it to 80. Now, what is important here to note is that you must use an even number. As I said before, there are two link rollers creating one link. So, one link is our final object that we need to duplicate, which has two rollers. Therefore, as these points represent the center points for each roller, we need to keep an even number. Otherwise, we will have a very strange, messed up chain at the end. Okay, so I tried 70 before, I'm going to try 80 now. So, I need to loop select the right half and count how many are. There are 17, so we're getting closer, so, but not enough still. So, I'm going to undo that, back to multiply, duplicate, more, rail clone. Let me try 90 this time. Okay, to that. Deselect and loop select everything on the right half. It says there are 19 points. Now, if you were, let me just quickly flip to point 36, uh, actually, point 36 layer. If I selected half of the points, it says there are 18 points. Now, as we are starting with a point vertical, when we're going to select our points, ignore the fact that I'm going to get twice as many points here. When I'm selecting my points, I cannot select this point here, as that would be more than half. I have to come back and select up here, this point here, so that all of these points counted around here, but not the one on the opposite side. So, bearing that in mind, I'll flip back to exactly where we were before. If I'm going to select this accurately, then I need to miss that point here and count the selection as 18. The next thing we need to do is to get this point here to sit exactly on this point, or as close to it as we can. So, I can use 90 duplicates for this. If you want me to quickly show you what 88 would look like, I'll just do that now. 88, OK. So, now you can see, if I loop select here, again, same as before, we have 18 selections. So what this means is that we can basically use either 88 links or 90. The difference is that this point will either be to the left, meaning that the chain is too short, sorry, opposite way around, meaning that the chain is too long in order for this point to sit on the x0 actually. If we use 90 links, it means that the 90 links is actually too long, too many. And we can't use 89, which may be almost accurate, because there are two links, two rollers per link. So, 88 or 90, it doesn't matter which you choose to use. Um, I might as well use 88 because that's what I'm last here on. So, the next point to do is to note that clone distribution layer, is to, we're going to rename this layer here. So, double click it, rename, add on to the end, clone underscore distribution underscore, and then you'll put in the number of clones that you'll be using. So, I'm going to use 88 here. So, click OK to that. This is just for a, a visual reference for later on, as we'll be reusing the same clone. You may come back to this later and just need to know that. Now, the reason we can't adjust the number of clones to, for example, 89, 87.8995, for example, in order to get this to sit on the line is because that's not the way we need to do this. The problem now isn't that we have an incorrect number of links in our chain. It's that our chain path is actually slightly too long now. Actually, sorry, is it too long or is it too short? 88 is probably too short then for this point to sit on there. Which means that we have to actually adjust the overall length of our chain. While we're at this stage where we have 88 clone links here, we need to do a quick measurement. We need to measure how far away this point is from the centre line here. This point here in the background represents where this point needs to end up. Okay, We can either do this as it's fairly horizontal, we can either use I for information to guess the figure, or we can use the measure tool, which is found under details, measure, and there's measure, so click on that. And funnily enough, it's called the measure tool, which is shortcut, control E, above the mouse. So, I've clicked that, it's given us this little magic wand here. The way the measure tool works is, you click 
at any point you wish to start your measuring distance, you click and hold. Now, what you need to do is look into this box here. This will be this is where um, the information for the length will be shown. Now, the value will only be shown while you have the mouse clicked and held down. So, this is why I'm pointing this out now because I can't do two things with the mouse at once. So, click, hold, drag a distance, and you'll see that the length is changing in millimeters down there. So. You can let go, it will remain on the screen until you deactivate the tool, but the value will have gone. Now, if you left click again, it will grab whichever point or which end of this measuring tool is closest to the mouse at the time. So, I'll hover the mouse somewhere around here, the front starting point, click and it will automatically snap back to the mouse. So, I'm going to put this roughly on the centre of this point, let go of the mouse button, click and drag to the other point, holding the mouse button down now. I'm going to see and check the length value. It says 2.8 millimeters, so make a mental note of 2.8 millimeters. Zoom out to this stage. Now, this clone section is actually no good to us as it is. It's close, it's helped us work out that we need 88 clones. So I'm going to undo this stage, so we're back to here. I'm going to spot the layers. Now, we have this unhidden, so we're going to loop select everything to do with the front sprocket. Oops. Let's try that again, just to loop round once this time. We have 61 points in our selection, which includes our centre point. I'm going to have to move this sprocket. Press T for move, N to activate the numeric panel. Start off with all the values zeroed. We're only going to deal with the X value. Now remember, 2.8 millimetres. So, we need to move this in the positive X, as it was too short, as it fell short of this, of the actual... Uh, dead zero x zero. So, 2.8 millimeters, and then you're going to have to multiply that by 2. It's only very rough. Hit tab, it gives you 5.6 millimeters as the distance we need to start by moving this. We'll probably have to do this stage maybe up to six times. So, I'm going to click apply only once. This has moved our disk closer. So, drop the tool, drop the selection. Swap layers again. This point is still our starting point. Back to multiply, duplicate, more, rail clone. 88, everything stays the same. OK to that. Now we need to zoom in on this bottom centre point here. You can see now that it's hopefully visibly moved closer. It's no longer 2.8 millimetres away. Uh, for this purpose, as it's very, as it's a pretty much horizontal, I'm going to use the I for information tool. And I'm going to look at the X value here. And it's at roughly half a negative half a millimeter out. So, I mean, you can literally select copy this entire value here, copy that into memory, click cancel, zoom out to see everything. Again, undo this stage as that's not correct. Swap the layers. We just need to redo this here. T to move, N for numeric. Paste our value in. As it's a negative value, we need to delete the negative at the front. Scroll on to the end, multiply that value by 2, hit tab to calculate, apply only once remember. That has moved our disk fractionally. Deselect, swap the layers again, so these splines in the background, and our clone distribution with this single point is at the start. Hopefully now you can see why we keep in this point here, because we're not going to move the rear sprocket at all, only the front sprocket, so this one will never move. Duplicate, more, rail clone again, 88, OK. Bottom point, I for information. OK, now we're getting down to it properly. This is at negative 0.4 of a micron. Now, that's as close as I'm going to bother with. And it's close enough, it's taken long enough to get here. OK, zoom in, it's as good as on there. Now, just going to invert the layers and highlight this loop here. Uh, one thing I need to point out, the way even the distribution works around this is that the starting point that you select, which is here, has to be absolutely accurate. It means that this point here on the chain is going to be the only fully accurate 100% snap-on point. And it means that the further away from this point, by the direction around the chain that you go, the less accurate 
the results of the location of the centre of the roller points will be. So, halfway around the chain is approximately here where the mouse is now. Around here somewhere will be the least accurate the chain will ever be for locating. This is just the way this method works. Um, it's the most accurate I've been able to find and visually when you create the final product it looks accurate enough. But I don't know, I'm a stickler for this kind of thing. It's not actually 100% accurate. Um, but with the tools that are available, it's good enough. So, as we don't have any actual reference location points of a sprocket around here, there's no point in using any of these points here. Um, you might think, okay, well we'll use the front sprocket then. However, the problem with using the front sprocket is that we don't know the rotation of the sprocket in relation to the chain. So, you can't actually use this. This is the sole reason why I have been using the furthest point away from the starting location that we actually physically know the location of, which is this point here. So, this is why I'm basically trying to align this point here as accurately as possible with the x-axis. Plus, using the eye for information is slightly more accurate than using the measure tool. The measure tool is a little inaccurate in the sense of the kind of when we're trying to drop down to a fraction of a micron, it's it's quite difficult to deal with. So we now have our clone distribution layer, 88 clones. We've now accurately adjusted the overall length of our chain so that this link is as accurately aligned with the position within the sprocket that it needs to slot in as we can get. Now I've mentioned that it will be inaccurate the front sprocket however um, the amount of inaccuracy we're looking at is going to be in the region at this scale for this pitch length bear in mind we're going to be dealing with a, we're looking for an accuracy of 0.3 millimeters approximately that means that one of the center points of the rollers will be roughly 0.3 millimeters out. That'll be the worst case scenario for any of these and we'll average out the error so that one of them for example may be 0.6 millimeters out while another point will snap in. We'll average the error out so that it will be 0.3 and 0.3. So, save the file. We've done the hard work. It's been tedious. It's not been much fun. <laughs> Let's be honest. But it's the end result we're looking for. So this will now conclude part two. And um, part three, I promise, will be a bit more fun. It will actually be less tedious and uh, more creative. We'll actually get some feeling of reward out of it when we're actually creating the links themselves and the actual sprockets as well. So we're going to be creating the actual geometry for this cloning effect. Uh, part four, on the other hand, is going to be another matter. You probably won't like part four but we'll find out. See you then. Ciao.